I just need for us to respond to that. And I'd like for you to keep playing that. Sing it again. And if you want to pray, these altars are not decorations. You come and pray right now. Let's put feet to that song. Let's put meaning to that song. Are you sorry? Caught up in your own agenda? Caught up in your own situations? Caught up in your own circumstances? We don't pray alone here at Hope Church. If you're here this morning and you feel a hand on your shoulder, it's because somebody's praying there with you. You don't want to come forward, you just make an altar right where you're at. Hope church is in the middle of revival. God's moving in his church. He's moving here in this place. You're a part of that this morning. God knows what's going on in your life. He knows the circumstances of the situation. We're here to meet with him. for our own agendas, we're sorry for our own lies, we're sorry for our own wickedness, we're sorry for the ways in which we've walked against you and what you've wanted. Lord, we come to you with repentance today. But Lord, we also come to you with a a sense of confidence and assurance that you love us and that you're here with us and you're here for us. And for each person that's kneeling at this altar, for each person that's sitting here in this sanctuary, for each person that might be watching online, Lord, we're here because we know you have the answers that we need. We're not just praying to these four walls, but we're praying to the very throne room of heaven this morning. And we're calling on the host of heaven. We're calling on the deliverance that comes and the victory that comes from heaven this morning. And Lord, we're looking forward with confidence, knowing that you're going to answer, not just hear our prayers, but answer our prayers. And Even right now, you're beginning the miracle in our own lives, in our own hearts, in our own situations, Lord. Miracles that only you can accomplish as we put our faith and our trust in you. Lord, deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the things that would so easily come against us. 
And Lord, in the powerful name of Jesus and by his shed blood, we rebuke the forces of darkness that would come against us. And we ask for your deliverance and for your blessing this morning over every person in this sanctuary. Lord, we need your help. We need your strength. We cannot do it alone. And so, Lord, I pray that there wouldn't be one person within the sound of my voice that would feel alone, that would feel like nobody cared, that would feel like nobody was listening. But, Lord, we've come here for a place to belong place to be connected, a place to love you and love each other. And I pray, Lord, that that message of hope would resonate in each person's heart this morning, that we can flee to the fortress of hope, to be prisoners of your hope this morning. Lord, I pray that you would lock the door and throw away the key, and we would never, ever leave the fortress of hope that you provide for each one of us this morning. Strengthen us, watch over us, be with us, help us, heal us, deliver us. For yours is the kingdom, and yours is the power, and yours is the glory, forever and ever and ever. Amen. 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 Thank you, Oksana. For those of you watching online, we welcome you this morning. We're so thankful that you're here with us and glad that you could join us. A shout out to Ivan this morning if he's listening. I have a scripture this morning that I want to share with you from John chapter 21. We're coming to the end of John and this morning I'm talking to you about what it means to have a living encounter with Jesus. Every person in this sanctuary, including myself, needs to have a living encounter with Jesus where you know that this is real. This is not just a story told from the ancient dusty pages of a forgotten tome in some library that nobody cares about. The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, of mind and body. And unless we have a living encounter with Jesus, we'll never understand what it means to live for Jesus, to be His disciple, and to understand what that looks like. And in John chapter 21, there's this great story, hilarious story, Wonderful story, transformational story. The story of the disciples after Jesus has died on the cross, they decide, seven of them, to go back to what they knew best. They went back to fishing. How many of you have ever been fishing before? All right, so we're in a group of fishermen, fisherwomen here this morning. Have you ever fished and not caught a thing? I mean, the only bite you got was the rocks on the bottom that your sinker would grab onto and you'd lose your bait and then you'd have to restring and you're back at it again. And you always want to say when you get done fishing, well, I got a couple bites. You know, anybody who hasn't seen a thing or felt a thing always says, well, you know, I got a couple bites. That was about it. Well, these seven men discouraged, despondent, not sure what the future would hold. After Jesus had died and all that had gone along with that, they decided to go back to fishing. And seven of them got on this little fishing boat, and they went out on that sea of Galilee there, and, uh, and they began to fish, and they began to fish and fish and fish and fish. The evening came and went. Midnight came and went, and still they fished. All through the night they fished, and not a thing. Finally, in the morning, they're headed back to shore. They get about a hundred yards from shore, and they hear a voice calling from a figure standing on the shore. A voice they didn't recognize at first with a very simple question. Have you caught any fish? 
You know, those seven guys, this was the last thing they wanted to hear and the last thing they wanted to say. The last thing they wanted anybody to hear is that they didn't know how to fish and hadn't caught a thing. (laughs) And the second thing they didn't want to do is admit it. But yet they answered back to that figure on the shore, no. And that figure on the shore, a hundred yards away, said one of the most ridiculous things that you could ever imagine. You know, those little fishing boats that they were in were probably only about eight feet wide. The nets that they cast out only went about 10 feet or so off the side of the boat. And that figure on the shore called out to them and said, throw your nets on the other side. Now, I'm sure there was at least one guy on that boat that said, look, we've been fishing all night long. We know what we're doing. There's no fish here. It wouldn't matter if we sailed all the way to the north end of the Sea of Galilee. There's certainly not going to be any fish less than 15 feet from where we just threw the nets. (laughs) We're almost to shore. Let's just go to shore. We've done enough damage for one night. (laughs) I'm done. I'm tired. This isn't working. And yet, at least a couple of the disciples said, well, you know what? What's it going to hurt? I mean, we've got the nets. We've got the boats. We're in the water. There's seven of us here. What do you say we just give it a try? And so a couple of them got on the other side of the boat They got that net all strung out, the weights all just where they needed to do, and then they cast that net. And wouldn't you know it, the biggest, baddest, largest fish in the whole Sea of Galilee were waiting less than 15 feet from their boat. They began to pull that in, and it says the number of fish there in your text over a hundred of the largest fish that any of them had ever seen. I believe the actual number was 153, for those of you who are keeping track. I don't know if you've ever caught one big three or four pound fish, but just one of those fish would have probably been enough to feed all seven of them for dinner. They didn't just have one, they didn't just have two, they just didn't have 10 or 50 or 75 or 100. 153 of the largest fish that they'd ever seen. Matter of fact, it was so many fish that the boat began to sink. Now, Simon Peter was on that boat, and he heard one of the disciples say, that's got to be the Lord. In other words, there's nobody else in the world who would tell us to do something like that And there's nobody else in the world where we get results like that. (laughs) Simon Peter, he put on his outer garments, it said, and he just dove in the water. It was only 100 feet to shore. He couldn't stand it anymore. He had to find out if it was Jesus. And when he got to the shore, Jesus was standing there next to a fire that already had fish on it and bread. And he said, what do you say we sit down and have some breakfast? Now there's three principles that I want to draw out of this story that I think are very pertinent to us and where we're living in our lives right now. And the first story is this. Even at our best, When we're trying with all that we know, sometimes we come up empty. Have you worked as hard as you could at something or in a situation as best you could and it just seems like nothing is bearing fruit? 
you're not getting any results at all from what you're trying so hard to do. You just come up empty. Maybe in your life, you've been fishing all night long. And you feel like you're up against it. And you don't know what the situation is going to be, and you don't know what the circumstances are going to be. I watched a movie recently about a young lady who was going through some terrible circumstances in her life. She'd grown up in a very difficult place, very difficult area of, of the community. Her father had left when she was so young she didn't even remember who he was. Her mother had died at an early age. Her brothers and sisters, one of them had passed away and the other one had moved out of state and didn't know where she was, didn't know anything about her. She was literally alone. As a young woman, she not knowing what to do, did what she could. Was in an abusive relationship. And her boyfriend, after she came home work from night, from one night, beat her up so bad, she didn't know what to do. She got up the next morning, he was being so rude to her for breakfast, that she took the frying pan and hit him right upside the head with it. And began to run. Because he was chasing her. She ran and she ran and she ran, and her boyfriend chasing right after her. And as she was running through these different places trying to find a door that would open, she opened the door of a Marine Corps recruiting station and fell in on the floor. And her abusive boyfriend with the frying pan marks on his face came rushing through that door after her. And as she laid there on the ground, a big Marine came up from behind the desk and stood over her as she laid there on the ground, her whole face bruised and bloody from the night before. Looked at that abusive boyfriend and said, there seems to be a problem here. That abusive boyfriend said, there's no problem here. This is between me and her. This has nothing to do with you. And he said, well, I want you to know, it does now. Because I'm here. Is there going to be a problem? Because you have a choice right now. He said this to the abusive boyfriend. You have a choice right now. And I want you to choose very carefully. Because I'm standing here as a United States Marine. That boyfriend looked at the situation and realized he was up against more than he could handle. And he walked out that door. And that Marine looked down at that young lady and said, what would you like to do? She said, I need a new life. I need a new direction. And he said to her, have you thought about joining the United States Marine Corps? <laughs> And she said, I have now. Where do I sign? <laughs> and let me just tell you, sometimes we fall in front of the feet of Jesus, bruised and bloody, fishing all night, don't have a future, don't have a life, our past is a mess. And Jesus looks at Satan and says, do we have a problem here? Because <laughs> I have somebody who wants to change, who wants a new life and a new direction and a new way of thinking. And let me tell you something. The Marine Corps will give you a new way of thinking. Once you join the Marine Corps, you're all in. You're the property of the United States government. You will do as they say and go where they say to go. But the point of the story is, she had found deliverance in the most unlikely of places. Some place she had never intended. But yet what she found there was the watch, care, and protection of a man of honor and integrity, a man who, for whom the principles of honor and integrity and caring for the weak and those that everybody else walks by was a part of his creed and who he was as a man. Let me tell you something, Jesus cares about the people that everybody else walks by too. And he's here with us right now. And if your best has done nothing but come up empty, I want you to know this. 
if you begin to walk with the people of God and you begin to join in with what we're doing and where we're headed and how we're living and how things are going, your life will change. And if you listen to the voice of Jesus as He speaks in His still small voice into your spirit and into your life, you might hear these words yourself. Put your nets on the other side. Because I don't know about you, but if I looked at the results of what they were coming up with, it was nothing. But yet as soon as they decided to cast their nets on the side of Jesus, the side He wanted them to fish on, the direction He wanted them to go, all of a sudden they had more blessings than they could handle. And let me just tell you something. I want to be on the side of Jesus. Because my second thought here is that Jesus provided for what they didn't have by using what they did have. They had a boat. They had the desire. They had the nets. They had the manpower. They just didn't have the blessing. And let me just tell you something. When you turn your life over to Jesus, He'll take everything you've got but then he'll add his blessing. And let me tell you something. That blessing is something I refuse to live without. I want to open up my heart and my life in, in obedience to what he asks me to do in every area of my life and say, God, may there not be one obstacle to your blessing in my life. May you be able to pour into my life all the blessings that you want to pour in. And may I not let one thing in the way of that. And so the question that I have for you this morning, and for myself, and for those watching online, is very simple. What side are you on this morning? Jesus side. Amen. Amen. Who are you going to be listening to when that still small voice comes in? How are you going to be living your life? What's that going to look like? Are you going to be like Simon Peter and say, hey boys, there's six of you. I'm out. The boat's sinking anyway. I'm headed to Jesus. Whatever that looks and whatever that means and however that's going to work out, I can't spend another second in this stupid boat. I'm gone. <laughs> Which brings me to this thought. It doesn't take much of a person to follow Jesus, but it takes everything of him or her that there is. We don't have to have life figured out. We don't have to have all the problems figured out. The disciples still had the same problem. The problems of their life didn't magically disappear. Just because they had breakfast with Jesus doesn't mean they weren't going to be hungry again later. But when Jesus got them around that fire and got him around that wonderful breakfast with that bread that he had made and created for them to have as they brought in their fish and did all the things that they were doing to prepare for that breakfast he began to ask Peter some questions and this last chapter of John ends with this great conversation between Jesus and Simon Peter, as he began to ask Simon Peter, do you love me? Of course, I love you, Simon Peter replied. Feed my lambs, Peter. And then again he asked him, do you love me? Lord, you know, I love you. Take care of my sheep, Peter. And again, Jesus is asking him, Simon Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know, and I'm grieved in my spirit as I answer, I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus responded. To feed the lambs, the weakest 
and the most vulnerable. To take care of the sheep, to watch over those who were in the flock. To feed the sheep, to give them something that they could respond to and live towards. The message of the love of Jesus, the blessing of Jesus, the provision of Jesus. And as we talk here this morning, there's so many of us that have our own agenda. (laughs) So many of us have our own ways of thinking about life. Some of us might say, well, I follow about 78.3% of the Bible. But there's some things that I just don't agree with, so, you know, sorry, Lord. You're on your own on that part. No, you're on your own at that part. (laughs) Because that last 11.5% can make all the difference in the world. (laughs) That last 22% can make all the difference in the world. (laughs) I'll get my math here straight in one of these days. We want to love each other and love God with everything we've got. And that brings me to my last thought this morning. The miracle wasn't just for what they needed. 153 fish. There's no way they could eat all that fish. Besides the fact, and this is something I find hilarious, Jesus didn't need their fish. He already had fish cooking on the fire. It wasn't about what he needed. It's about how they could see that they could be a blessing to others. I'm sure 153 of the largest fish in the Sea of Galilee would have fed the whole village. And the interesting thing about it too is that even with a net full of fish that was practically sinking the boat, The net didn't tear. The net didn't break. The boat didn't sink. Everybody made it to shore. Not one thing that they were dealing with was damaged or broken. Jesus saw to that. On top of a bountiful blessing that fed and nourished everyone around them. And when we get on the right side of life, the side that Jesus wants us to be on. He's going to take what we've got and He's going to turn it into a blessing to everyone else around us. The miracle that He brings to us is going to be used with the things that we already have on hand. And the blessing and the miracle that He brings to us is not just for us, but it's to be a blessing to those around us. The question is, the question that rings down through time from the lips of Jesus to the ears of Simon Peter and his disciples that were there with him. Do you love me? Jesus said these words, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You'll listen to what I say. You'll live by how I've called you to live. You'll do the things I've called you to do. You'll live in such a way that Your life can be a reflection of the very best of what I've created you to be. And that's the call of heaven this morning to each one of us. Will we allow God to work in our lives? Will we accept his truth fully? Not just part of the truth, all of his truth. Will we apply that to our lives? Even in the things we don't understand. Because let me tell you something. When it comes to the unborn of our culture, I'm on the side of Jesus and the value that he gives to human life. When it comes to the sanctity of marriage and the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman, I'm on the side of Jesus when he said, a man shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. When it comes to the principles of of what it means to live the way God has called us to live and not abuse the alcohol and the drugs and all the stuff that's coming through our culture. I'm on the side of Jesus when he says we're better than that and we won't succumb to that. We won't do that. Now, I'm not saying alcohol is a sin. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying that for some of us, 
we need to stay away from it. And I want us to understand and recognize that the principles that God has laid down and the way he's taught us to live and the people he's called us to be is for our blessing, for what he wants for us. For those of you that may have been discouraged by life this week, for those of you that may be weary under the load and you've been fishing all night, be listening for that still small voice from the shore of life to the sea of your chaos. Throw your net on the other side. Let me be the source of your blessing. Let me be the source of your provision. Let me be the source of your future. And then the question, do you love me? And how will we respond to that question? How will we live that out into the community this week? Will be what it means, will be the test of what it means to live into the blessing that God has for us. Would you stand together with me as we close our service today? The truth of God's word has been spoken in this sanctuary today. And I pray God's blessing over it and into your hearts and minds. For those of you watching online, I'd like to pray a prayer with you as we close, as well as those that are here. And I'd just like to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment with nobody looking around. Say, Pastor Matt, there are some areas of my life where I'm not allowing God to do everything he wants to do, and I'm putting up some obstacles myself to what he wants me to do, and I'm going to ask God to help me Release those to him this morning. Would you just raise your hand so I can pray with you? Thank you, I see your hands. Thank you, I see your hands. Thank you, thank you, I see your hands back there. Thank you, I see your hands back there. Thank you, I see your hands over there. Thank you, I see, thank you, I see your hands back there in the back. God knows your heart. He knows what's going on in your life. And he is here in this place, in this sanctuary right now. Heavenly Father, as you walk through in the power of your Holy Spirit, the hearts and minds of each person watching online and each person here in this sanctuary, we proclaim that we are on the side of Jesus this morning. And we also repent for those areas of our life that we are struggling, where we are not allowing you to bless us the way you want to because of our own rebellion, our own sin, our own evil, our own suffering, our own backgrounds, all the stuff that makes us who we are, our lack of ability to trust, our lack of ability to let go, our pride, our ego, all these things are wrapped up in this big mess of who we are. And so, Lord, we're calling on you and asking you to help us. We're asking you to be the answer that we need in these situations of life. Show us where to throw our nets, Lord. Help us to run towards you and if we have to, swim towards you like Simon Peter did. Help us to have that same desire to be in your presence, Lord. And help us to learn how to love you with all of our hearts and all of our souls and all of our minds. Lord, I know that this is a difficult time in many people's lives and a lot going on. But Lord, in your strength and in your power, we ask for a miracle. A miracle that we can't accomplish by ourselves, but as we put our faith and trust in you, that you can accomplish through us and in us. Lord, I've tried to be faithful to your word this morning, and I ask you to bless my words and the anointing of the Holy Spirit into thoughts, into people's minds that have heard it, that they would be blessed to live for you, that they would be blessed by you, that they would walk in this community of hope where everyone belongs and everyone is loved by you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you.